Um, before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations on whose land we're meeting today, to pay my respects to their elders past and present, and also to extend that respect to anyone uh, joining us via the live stream or in the room today who has a connection to the world's oldest continuing culture and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, we will have time at the end of the session for uh, about 10 minutes worth of questions. So if you do have questions, please submit them via Slido um, in case you missed how to get a question in the app. Just scan the QR code on the back of your phone. There's a little uh, hamburger menu. Click on that, go to chat and Q&A and down to the loft um, Q&A section. And I'll get to as many of them as possible. All right, please make Anne-Marie feel very welcome. Hey. Oh, well, uh, yes, hello, everyone, and thanks to APRA AMCOS for having me here. And uh, so a really quick self-introduction. Um, I'm Anne-Marie Webber, and I've been working as a sound designer in the Australian games industry since about 2005, and these are just, like, some of the many tiles I've worked on in that time. Uh, the game I'm currently working on is uh, a game called Thirsty Suitors. Uh, that's with Outer Loop uh, Games, which is a fully remote studio. And we actually have a demo for that out on Steam right now, if you want to check that out. The game's not out yet, but we do have a demo, so I can talk about it a little bit. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> making audio the solution, like, what does that even mean? Uh, this sort of started off where I wanted to share, like, some interesting game development problems that can, can be solved by audio. And I think it's... Uh, you know, specifically ones that are multidisciplinary and have reached beyond uh, just the aesthetic, because I think this is one area where that really like separates good audio design for games from like good audio design for film and television. And this is like maybe a topic that's somewhat beaten to death, but I do actually think it's like really easy, especially when you're like a contractor or an external audio partner, like many of us often are, uh, to kind of get into a bit of a rut and hyper-focus on only solving our audio problems and how the game design affects audio aesthetically. And, you know, sometimes that can't be helped because of, like, budget or time or political reasons, and I'm guilty of this too. Uh, but that's why it's, like, kind of all the more important to, you know, that we're conscious of it and, you know, we focus on doing, like, proactive audio design instead of just purely reactive. So, like, that's sort of the high-level goal for this, but we're actually going to focus on just a couple of concrete examples, which I hope that maybe you'll be find useful in your own projects. And these are telegraphs, uh, difficulty and timing, and voiceover and lip sync. And I chose these three topics specifically because they all have impacts on accessibility, they all involve multiple disciplines within the game team, and they all kind of have considerations beyond the aesthetic. And I am, I am kind of using the term accessibility a little loosely here. Maybe, like, a better term might be inclusivity, uh, because none of these are, like, specifically addressing accessibility standards so much as they're kind of tangentially, like, related to achieving those standards. Um, you know, things like managing the game difficulty uh, to make it more inclusive for more players and handling the ramifications of, like, pursuing a lot of voiceover, things like that. And... Uh, you know, I, I also want to reassure people, like, this is described as a tech masterclass, but you don't need to be, like, super technically proficient person to do any of this. Uh, none of what I'm going to go over here requires, like, super advanced programming or implementation know-how. Just kind of a bit of research and thoughtfulness. <clears throat> so let's kick off with, like, a fairly low-hanging fruit, so telegraphs. Uh, in terms of games, telegraphs uh, usually refers to, like, action games where there's some action happening on the screen which demands a player response. It's like whether that's like dodging or guarding or attacking in a vulnerability window. Uh, it's kind of, it's good game design to, you know, warn your player about it. So, you know, what does the warning look like? Maybe it's just like a wind-up animation or a flashing UI or particle effect uh, or ground markers that show up before damage goes out. And, you know, you've got uh, games like Elden Ring, actually, where many... Uh, Telegraphs are very subtle and very fast, and that's like a big reason for why that game is considered so difficult. And, but you know, say you don't work for FromSoft and you don't particularly want to make a super hard game, uh, you have to be thinking about what role audio plays in telegraphs. 
Uh, so, you know, I really actually, <coughs> I hate bringing up Hand of Fate, like, four years after it came out, but I haven't actually released any action games lately, so this is kind of the most handy example I had. Uh, but let's have a quick listen to this, so I can have a drink of water. <laughs> All right, so uh, this like flame-breathing thief is one of the earliest enemies you encounter in the game, and that has, that has an unblockable attack, so the aim was to be like super generous with his telegraph, right? And so as you can see here, we had a reasonably long animation uh, with a red icon that lets you know he's performing an unblockable attack, but without the audio tell, it's really, really easy to miss, especially when there's a lot of enemies around. And like when playtesting this, this guy was actually really hard to deal with uh, until we added the audio tell in. Um, and so like, you know, this is pretty obvious stuff, right? Like, not that much thought really needs to go into it, right? Well, wrong, because there's actually, there's actually quite a lot of numbers worth knowing when uh, you're considering designing your telegraphs, uh, which I researched a whole lot up in Hand of Fate so I could, you know, more effectively collaborate with the designers and animators. And I'm going to like share these with you, so you don't have to do that research. Um, so like the first and most important number is that the average human reaction time is 200 milliseconds, which is this long. <laughs> Oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, caught you off guard, didn't it? <laughs> Uh, okay, so like for another point of reference, like your average blink, that's 100 to 150 milliseconds, which is a full half of that time. So, you know, uh, you're out of luck, actually, if you blink at the wrong moment, uh, unless you have audio, yeah. Um, but like now, now we also have to consider, that's actually the mean visual reaction time. Uh, auditory stimulus reaches the cortex faster than visual stimulus by like a whole 40 milliseconds about. Uh, and, you know, that time is then actually immediately eaten up again by input lag, so uh, that's about <laughs> 15 to 40 milliseconds on average. But, like, I mean, you know, that right there is why audio needs to be super aware of its goal in creating good telegraphs, because, you know, if we assume that the average telegraph length is only 200 milliseconds, and both the audio and the visuals start at the same time without blinking, uh, you know, taking into account input lag, you would miss it, but uh, with audio, you'll hit it, even if you blink. So we can't like just purely rely on uh, attaching audio to visual tells, because we have to like really think about this if we're concerned about helping the team reach their difficulty goals. Because, you know, of course, 200 milliseconds is actually super, super punishing. Uh, for even pretty good players, right? Uh, if any of you are familiar with, like, you know, lag and whatnot, you know, 200 milliseconds, that's, that's rough to deal with. A full half of your players will also be slower than that because that's the average reaction time. And older players or players with uh, physical challenges can also expect to be slower than that. And we also have to consider how long does it actually take to, like, how much time does do you need to create, create a recognizable sound that contains useful information? Like, and if you're not concerned with aesthetics, you can, uh, you know, have the fun little slide whistle or a beep. Uh, but if you're in like a hyper-realistic serious style, which most games tend to be, uh, you're probably going to want to find a way to do a more diegetic tell, and that takes time. Uh, so like with all this in mind, I would actually say that if you really want at a bare minimum for your audio cue to kick in at least 500 milliseconds before the damage goes out for the vast majority of your players to even have a hope. Uh, and, you know, the easier and more inclusive you want your, to tune your game to be, the longer you should be making that telegraph. So, like, just to drive that home, let's do a quick comparison. So the Fire Breath in Hand of Fate 2, the telegraph for that was 1,500 milliseconds long. So let's play that real quick. So that's the sound that shipped with the game, and we were all pretty happy with that. Players seemed to manage it all right. Now let's put that at what I consider to be like the absolute bare minimum, 500 milliseconds. Yeah, that's getting pretty difficult, but you know, 
still within the reach of a good player. But now let's put at what is like, you know, the theoretical shortest you could do, uh, 200 milliseconds. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just rubbish, you know? So that's, that's, that's basically why I think 500 is the true minimum, even though, uh, you know, science tells you otherwise. Uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything shorter than 500, or even, I probably wouldn't even touch 500 unless I was deliberately making things hard, or to troll the player, you know? Which, that is a thing. That's a whole genre of game. <laughs> okay, so, um, that kind of takes into account telegraphs for action games, but like, what about other kinds of telegraphs? And so here, here I want to talk about timing type minigames. So like the picture I chose here is a uh, no accident. Final Fantasy VII Remake had a timing-based minigame in the gym that was considered stupidly hard. Uh, the main advice, if you look it up online, in defeating it on its hardest mode is to go into the game mixer and disable everything except the UI sounds. <laughs> you know, because the, the background music and the audio throw, throw off people's timing. And you don't, you don't want that, right? That's awful. Uh, people shouldn't feel the need to turn off all the rest of your lovely audio to play the game better. I'm like, I love audio, and I turned off all the audio to, to finish this game. It's really sad. We don't want this. Uh, so this became super relevant for me recently, because on Thirsty Suitors, a big part of our gameplay is based around uh, timing, timing events, you know. Uh, the game isn't out yet, but you know, as I said, we have a demo out on Steam, so while it's a very basic early game example, I can show you a little clip from the demo for context. So let's play that. I'm not losing to a guy wearing formal shoes to a diner. They're Italian leather. I bought them on my year abroad. Already loves me, and I can work on your mom. <laughs> All right. Okay, so uh, the game actually initially started off. You might be able to tell as a bit of a more rhythm game element, and then, like fairly early in the course of development, we sort of decided we wanted to pivot to a more RPG type experience. And so kind of like rather than a full on uh, rhythm mini game, we sort of wound up with uh, beat based timing mini games. <laughs> now I've got a bit of a terrible confession. I actually don't super like the timing guide sound we have for this. I wanted something a little bit flashier with a bit more style, a bit more unique, a little less metronome. Uh, but the main reason I've stuck with this is because, holy moly, what a difference it made in playtests. I have not found anything else that does the job nearly so well. Uh, so, like, one, one fantastic thing Outloop does is we actually do a lot of playtesting with people outside the studio very early on. So we got, like, lots of super useful data from that. And uh, just having the inputs on the beat alone, a lot of the playtesters were really, really struggling to uh, hit the timing window reliably. And so, excuse me, that's when I started to looking into ways audio could help with that. Okay, so now let me take you on a journey with this to explain how we wound up with this solution. So what we needed was a sound that could cut through the mix, work at any point in the music track, and also across multiple different music tracks. I think there's like 50 tracks in the game right now, and 35 of those need to have this uh, minigame tell in them. And we also need to help guide the player to hit the note on the beat. And so I went through about 25 iterations, actually, trying to find a sound effect that could do all those things. And there was a stage where I was experimenting with a whole bunch of sweeps, and playtesters actually got worse at it. <laughs> so, you know, let's, let's have a listen to these and see if you can, like, spot, spot the problem. Okay, yeah, so you know, some of these are actually kind of a bit goofy. Um, they didn't make it out of the brainstorming stage, and you know, a lot of them would be actually quite fatiguing to hear over and over again. 
But like even more importantly that, none of them helped with the timing. Um, and there's a really good lesson to learn from this. And that is the one thing all of these had in common, which is they were relying on pitch reaching a certain point to tell the player when to press the button. So the lesson I took away from this, which uh, is that pitch is not inclusive, which you know, seems very obvious in retrospect, but took me 25 iterations to realize. Uh, we know that there is a very wide spectrum of pitch sensitivity, and even not including perfect pitch, a lot of people aren't so good at relative pitch as well. Obviously, no one here, because we're all you know, great <laughs> audio people. Um, I actually uh, kept chasing this idea mainly because of Sayonara Wild Hearts, who did, this, did use this method to very cool effect and was one of the uh, inspirations for our game. Uh, it's actually a really fantastic game, by the way. I recommend you check it out if you haven't already, because uh, I'd say it's actually one of the most perfect marriages of music and sound design I've ever seen. Uh, but this kind of sort of meant I was stuck. Uh, I went and researched quite a lot of games, and rhythm games, generally speaking, don't have any sort of timing assistance beyond the music itself and the visual. And the only other examples I could find were sort of like rhythm, you know, games like Rhythm Heaven or WarriorWare, which were sort of more reflex or repeat after me type mini games. So then I actually went back to one of the other key touchstones of the game's design inspiration, which, believe it or not, was actually Paper Mario. And this was where I finally hit on the timing idea. Uh, specifically, it was the hammer attack with its three, two, one, go. Uh, so I was like, well, really, I just want them to hit the button on the beat. Why not just use this concept? And it worked so heckin' well. People were suddenly getting perfects on first and second try. Uh, they were much more reliably hitting the minigames all the way through. Uh, when the demo came out recently, I even watched one person like play on an absolute potato of a machine where like the visuals were lagging terribly, and they were still hitting all the minigames anyway because they were triggering it entirely off the sound. So yeah, you know, yay, we, we solved the issue of making beat ma matching minigames easier. Everything's great, right? <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> There's still, still one little implementation hiccup you should be aware of for this. So uh, the musically inclined among you have probably already spotted it. Uh, we have input occurring correctly on the beat, right? But you can't just take a one second tell and divide that into four to hit the beat and have it sound like it's in time. Uh, unless, you know, unless, of course, your, your BPM is the mathematically beautiful 120 BPM, which is uh, you know, my, my new favorite number on this project. Uh, unfortunately, our composer does not love writing in, in one BPM, which is very understandable, but uh, has meant I've had to get a bit creative. <laughs> uh, so for the song in the example I showed, that actually has a BPM of 105. And the majority of the minigame telegraphs in the game are one second long. And, you know, one, so one second feels about right, right? For the same reason we were talking about telegraphs earlier. Uh, the audio can't go any earlier than that because, you know, in game development, we can't tell the future. Uh, we cannot trigger the sound before the minigame has spawned into existence. And, you know, so we're, we're stuck with one second. So what we actually have to do here is get fractions of a beat. And to get the three, two, one go effect, we need to fit three, two, one into the preceding second. If we simply divide the beat in half, we get 285 milliseconds. We work backwards from the one second mark, you know, figure out that we have to trigger the finger clicks at 715, then 430, then 145. It's all very dry, I'm sorry, but that's uh, been a lot of my life for the past year. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and that, that sounds like this, you know. Yeah, bit person cuts through the mix really nice though. Not so fun on its own, but <laughs> does the job. But you know, we have a whole game with a whole soundtrack with a whole bunch of other BPMs to take into account. So, you know, yeah, actually very different sound. Might not sound like it out of context, but uh, you know, the more mathematically beautiful 120 BPM. <laughs> uh, in the case of Thirsty Suitors, I solved this by simply running a state machine, actually, which I pictured here. Uh, took a quick snapshot of the WYS uh, state. Uh, WYS does have a setting in the B, you know, to, to set the BPM for the music, but I also elected to uh, 
have a state system outside of that so that the rest of the game's audio knew what was happening in the music. And that runs a switch, which triggers the correct finger click pattern for the BPM every time. Sounds nice and tidy. and means that playtesters are hitting that window more often than not. Okay, so we should probably move on from timing, which was very dry, and let's talk to something that's something even more dry, uh, voiceover. <laughs> So uh, this is actually the one problem I'm most excited to share with you all, uh, because in recent years, especially with the big push towards accessibility, full voiceover is getting a lot more common in games. Uh, projects that would normally avoid the cost are starting to find the budget for it, and that's, that's awesome, that's great. But this does have ramifications, because voiceover is one of the perfect examples of where audio interacts with the rest of the game team. I would actually say it's probably the one audio, like, a uh, facet that involves the most departments. We've got writing, cutscenes, localization, animation, programming, pretty much everything. Uh, it's also one of the few cases where audio can create dependencies and ruin other people's day. Uh, the biggest of these, I'd say, are you know, localization and lip sync. Uh, nobody likes these things, and they come at the end of the project where everybody is hammered and tired, and it's often like a huge and daunting job that we are all super eager to automate away. So. Sorry, oh, what a great sound. Um. <laughs> okay, so for thirsty suitors, we have an awful lot of writing, and we're committed to, at the very minimum, ensuring that at least the main story quest line is fully voiced. And so the time came to look for a lip sync solution. Uh, we needed something that looked half decent, but was also super, super scalable. Now, so like good lip sync has kind of historically been a burden on the animation team, but Outlook, we only have the one animator. He is very fantastic, but there is only one of him. So we really needed a solution that didn't rely on him. So I actually hadn't done any uh, serious lip syncing in a game for a few years now because like Hand of Fate just did the tricky thing where we gave, uh, gave the dealer a mask, right? <laughs> just, just get out of the whole problem. Um, but I, you know, in the distant past, I'd, I'd done a few other solutions that weren't that great. So I kind of thought, hey, it's 2022. Surely this is a solved problem by now. Someone has to have solved this. So I set out to do some research, which uh, you might have noticed a theme here. Uh, I, every time you have a game dev problem, before you try anything, I really, really recommend just researching it to death. Ask your discords, go on Google, watch 5 million GDC talks. Don't waste time reinventing the wheel. Uh, but unfortunately, what I found was that the missing middle uh, still kind of hadn't been properly addressed in lip sync. Uh, indies were still mostly using lip flap and canned animation, and AAA were either using motion capture or like really personnel intensive solutions like hand tagging and hand animation, or some combination thereof. Or there you had CD Projekt Red, which was like developing a whole AI to do it. So, like, the big, expensive AAA options were off the table for us already. Uh, so I went and looked again at the traditional indie methods, which I'll talk about these briefly in case uh, anyone here isn't familiar with them. Uh, so for those who don't know, lip flap or chin flap usually refers to a type of lip sync where you just tie the amplitude of your voiceover to the lips or, the, well, you know, the chin bone and animate that based on that value. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll do some things like, you know, uh, add some thresholds and smoothing to keep it from looking completely pants, but it will, like, you know, pick up on po false positives, like S sounds and T and M sounds are all, you know, very problematic with traditional lip flap. But it is, you know, it is a case of where you kind of set it up and then you can just kind of ignore it forever after that. It's very, very cheap. Uh, and you know, it is, it is actually good at thing, excuse me, things like yelling, like characters will open their mouths really wide when they're being really loud, so it's not, it's not all bad. <laughs> uh, but like another more popular method is to have a sort of a, a walla walla, you know, uh, type looping speaking animation where characters will make random mouth shapes and you turn on and off either based on like the amplitude or maybe the duration of the line you know, whatever suits your purposes best. And this is definitely a better solution. It does involve a little bit more work from the animator and is prone to bad dub syndrome like that you would see in uh, all the old martial arts movies. 
and uh, with the mouth, you know, we'll keep moving in even when the character is not talking and movements will be dramatically off. It's not like a bad solution for like cartoony games or like Flavor of the Earth with unimportant NPCs, you know, so it's, again, not great, but, uh, you know, I really, I decided they were both rubbish. <laughs> And I really, really wanted to find a better solution for our game. Uh, so I looked into the AI thing initially, thinking, well, obviously, we can't use CD Projekt Red's AI, uh, but maybe there are some other like, you know, solutions that are accessible to indies. And uh, you know, I, I, skipping ahead, like, uh, I, I did learn a little bit about NVIDIA's universe. It doesn't really plug into, into, into our workflow at all, but it did. Uh, give me the launching off point where I got to learn an awful lot about forced alignment. <sighs> so, now I didn't really understand what forced alignment was until I started looking into it, so I'm going to assume that most audio people are similarly unaware, so I'll take a minute to explain it. And this will sound very scary and technical, but it's actually not that bad for our purposes, because we don't actually need to like super deeply understand it to use it. So forced alignment is when you have a speech file and a matching text tr transcript, and a trained algorithm uses that to figure out which phonemes play when. So for reference, if you're familiar with the term phonemes, phonemes are basically all the distinct sounds within the language. Uh, sort of like syllables, but even more broken down. Uh, like, so in English, I think there's 44 distinct phonemes. So it'll be like all the just the t and the t and the, you know, ah, and all the different pronunciations of ooh. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's very, very, very granular. So maybe like a really, a really, really dumbed down explanation would be to say it's kind of like voice recognition made more accurate by the uh, algorithm already knowing what the voice is supposed to be saying. So now actually when I, dis this was when I actually discovered that some force alignments actually do already exist in Unity. Isn't that great news for everyone? Uh, the ones we looked at, they weren't crash hot though. <laughs> uh, they were better than lip flap, and uh, the real issue was that they didn't fit into our workflow at all. Like uh, our subtitles in VR entirely triggered off a Unity plugin known as Ink, and our audio was run off WYs, and so it was kind of like a double, double whammy of incompatibility. But it did give us the launch point for our final solution. So researching around, the best of the best force alignment plugins was an open source Linux plugin called Gentle. And with the help of our very excellent programmer, Justin, we paired the audio files with the Google Docs script that we also use to run our localization and used it to batch run the plugin to generate the phoneme information, which it then outputs into text form with the phoneme type and the time codes. And then we then take that information and we convert it into marker data. <laughs> and then we batch apply that marker data onto the corresponding waveforms, which I then import to WYs, <laughs> and then bam, the game has access to that information. We can then use those markers in the voice files to drive mouth shapes or blend shapes, if I'm gonna be technical about it. And uh, because we made our own method, we could do as many discrete shapes as we wanted. Uh, you know, by breaking up the 44 phonemes into sensible groups, because you know a lot of mouth shapes are shared across them, and you don't want to ask your artist to do 44 distinct mouth shapes, they'll kill you. All right, I think we did like eight or nine in the end, um, just based on you know how much time our modeler had. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so the great part of it, though, is is that it's super scalable, right? Uh, with more resources, you could make more mouth shapes and have even more accurate, you know, lip sync if you wanted. So this was the final result. Yeah. I still think about our first kiss. You remember? On the trip to the Seattle Aquarium in third grade. It was so magical. Our lips touching bathed in the blue-green light of the tank, surrounded by moon jellies. You told everybody in third grade exactly how magical it was. I didn't know it was a secret. I mean, you were such a weedy little nerd back then. Were you ashamed of me? Is that why you ignored me all through middle school? Don't tell me you're still this oblivious. I was way out of your league in middle school. 
I like you even more when you're mean to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, our excellent scripts from our excellent script writers, Megan and Nadia. <laughs> so uh, the result, though, is, if you can see there, we actually thought it was really, really good. Like, we were super, super pleased with it. Only about 1% of the files, I'd say, needed some hand editing to, like, fix up. And we could also then leverage the system to include tags for things like facial expressions, like smiling and frowning. So in this way, we kind of took what was like a huge burden on the animation team. And it was like suddenly able to be largely handled by audio processors, freeing them up to do custom animation for the more important moments. Uh, we had a much higher quality lip sync than normal for a very, very reasonable amount more work. And it's, you know, it's not perfect by any means, but it's a really good solution that's a big step up from the traditional indie lip syncing without the huge price of AAA solutions. And it has a lot of customizability as well. So, you know, if you do have a little bit more budget and you can have your artists make more mouth shapes, as I said, or more expressions. So I'm, you know, as a result, a very big fan of forced alignment. And I do think all the indie sound designers out there need to know about it so they can help their team have much better lip sync as well, because, you know, good lip sync makes your uh, voiceover look better. <laughs> and I think I've spoken a little fast, so that kind of wraps things up. Uh, these were kind of just like three examples of audio design uh, proactively solving game problems. There is obviously many, many more, but I hope some of these topics can help you in your own games and maybe help you employ uh, like the proactive audio design mindset. I really want to see better lip syncing in indie, indie games, and I want to see more audio used for timing assistance for not just rhythm or beat-based mini games, but things like quick time events. And I also want to see uh, some more sensible telegraphs, and not just because I'm bad at being bad at Elden Ring. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, I, that's pretty much all I have. Do we? We've got some time for questions, though. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, nice. Ooh, is this working? Yes, it is. So Excellent. So, <laughs> oh, go on. <laughs> I'll have a sit. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was, a, <laughs> <laughs> that was a fantastic talk. Something I really love about this conference is I feel like the masterclasses really are masterclasses. Yeah. Like, they're not vibes-based presentations. They're mm. specific. Um, we've only got a couple of questions, mm. but... Uh, the first one from Xander is, how do you deal with the rhythm action sound being on time despite input lag? Uh, well, you just make your uh, window a little bit forgiving <laughs> is, is the easy answer. We actually spoke to the guys at Harmonix about this early on, and that was part of the reason why we decided we wanted to switch to more RPG uh, type more forgiving uh, mini games because it is actually a, a hellscape of technicality you have to deal with in terms of input lag. So just, just make sure that your perfect doesn't require like a, a 10 millisecond window and it's, it kind of takes care of itself actually. Yeah. Uh, Lane asks, do you have any plans to release a more technical, detailed breakdown of your lip sync solution? Uh, yeah, I was actually going to do a, uh, a GCAP talk for this initially, but uh, I ran out of time, <laughs> and, uh, which was going to be a bit more of a deep dive. So yes, yes, I will go further into it, and if anyone wants to know more about it, I'm quite happy to explain it in exhaustive detail, <laughs> because I'm very, very enthusiastic about it. <laughs> Sick. Hmm. Um, you have only a couple of minutes to get your questions in. So we're on the last question on Slido right now. So, oh, you know, get them in there. Um, and this one is quite simple. It's just that you mentioned a game that you described as the perfect marriage of games and music, but the audience member did not catch the name. Oh, what Sa was the game? Sayonara Wild Hearts. It's sort of like a, um, I would almost say it's like a playable music video. It's uh, very, very cool, very stylistic, really recommend. Like, if you love music and games and audio, everyone needs to play it. Yeah, I'm a big fan. <laughs> yeah. um, could you talk a little bit? <laughs> Do we get another one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, got, we got the question. Oh, no. The video game talk question. No, you'll like it. Oh. <laughs> um, but could you talk a little bit more about Sayonara Wild Hearts and how it marries kind of gameplay with music in a way that's meaningful, I guess? Well, it's, um, 
I mean, every every song is it's fully it's fully crafted. Mm. The whole you have whole sweeping sections where you're um, you know, you're driving your motorbike and the the entire environment is following the music. It's I would actually say the game was designed around the music first. And then because of that, things like all of, all of your collectibles are in key with the music, but not only that, they're timed to only appear at the correct parts of the song. Um, so they are in themselves become a really important element of the music. They're still optional. You don't have to hear them. You have to actually collect them in a way to, to hear the whole song. So it's, it's just really beautiful. Uh, I don't even, yeah, it's, I, I'm just, I could type it up all day. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you may have a chance to, because oh, it's fine. It's fine. If we the all next question yeah. is, what is your favorite game ever and why? <laughs> oh, I mean, oh, maybe not that one. Uh, <laughs> it, is, it is really good. We're done with Sayonara Wild Hearts yeah, here. We're done. We're, we're moving finished. on. Maybe Journey? I think I really liked Journey mm -hmm. because it's, um, the sound design in that is just lovely. It's got a very quiet soundtrack, so it was a real chance for sound design to really shine and provide the the landscape and, you know, the entire soundscape is just beautiful and polished and, uh, and it's, it's a beautiful game. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, that would probably be my answer for that one. Mm. Um, it's, it's a bit of a cliche if you ask an audio person, a lot of them will <laughs> say journey, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I got, I got basic taste. <laughs> cliche for a reason. Yeah. Um, there's actually another question here that leads on uh, from that answer very well, which mm. is, could you tell us about any games you encountered in your research that were interesting at an audio level? Ah, uh, I mean, well, nearly every game has something interesting to say audio-wise, right? Uh, I mean, I, I, found, I found some interesting things actually in what, not what to do, like Osu, for example, is a wildly popular rhythm game, right? When I was researching that, I found that everyone hates the whistle. <laughs> like, there's entire forum threads dedicated to how much they dislike the whistle on that. So I'm like, okay, not going to do that. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, it's, that doesn't really answer the question. It just kind of sprung to mind. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, just asking favorite or interesting games. That's impossible. It's like, how, how, do, you, how do you choose everything? Yeah, I, I looked at a lot of rhythm games, and I was actually really surprised at how little audio design is in rhythm games, actually. Uh, because one, another part of the game I looked at for Thirsty Suitors was for your inputs. Because you have, obviously, you have to have inputs that sound right with whatever music track you've made, right? Mm. And um, a lot of them just go for percussion, you know, a lot of tambourines. That's about it. There's not a lot of variation. Like, <laughs> There's a few other things. I think like Muse Dash does some interesting things. I think you, you've got a choice of having cat sounds and stuff. <laughs> but uh, it's, yeah, I think, I think we can probably, that's a space we can do better in, actually. I think we can explore some more interesting, uh, well, that wasn't even really an example of like games that did it really well, so much as a space that we can do some interesting things in, because I think there's some room for us to explore still. Yeah. Um, maybe on the other side of that, uh, from an audio design perspective, what do you think makes a great video game soundtrack and what uh, potential problems do you think can arise uh, during implementation? I mean, to be honest, I don't think I've ever heard like a, a video game soundtrack I didn't like. They're all pretty <laughs> great. Um, obviously, there, uh, you know, I, th I think about that, but I also think the, there is a thing, there's fatigue, I think is an important thing. Uh, it doesn't matter if you've got like the best song of all time, if you have to hear it 10,000 times in a row, especially if you have to hear the start of it 10,000 times in a row, um, you're just going to really hate those two bars by the end of the game, even if they're really brilliant. Uh, so I think that would be uh, maybe, maybe my answer for that one. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, that's how I feel about the coffee theme in Persona 5. Yes. Independently, I really like it, but after like Actually, I love Persona 5. 150 hours. Du, 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 du. <laughs> Can't do it. Yep, yep. Um, just one more question. Um, mm -hmm. How, wait. So, oh, you all came out with the questions right at the end, didn't you? <laughs> we actually have like six more questions here, but I'll try to pick a good one. Oh, okay, okay. Um, opinions on integration differences between WISE, FMOD, and in-house audio engines. Oh my God, I have so many opinions on this, <laughs> like so many. WISE is my favorite now, mm. mostly because I've never ever hit a wall in WISE. Um, 
if I've wanted to do something, sometimes it can be very cursed and uh, elaborate, but I've always been able to do it, which has not been the case for any other uh, engine solution. I'd say in-house solutions, uh, they're not that different, actually. I do think you're often reinventing the wheel. It's probably usually cheaper. Uh, if, you, if you've got a, um, unless you're like a really big studio, like you know Ubisoft or something, and even they tend to use like WIs or FMOD. Um, there's not a lot of value in doing your own. Programmers like it. They don't like FMOD and WIs because they can't see into them. It's a black box to them. But uh, yeah, F FMOD's also great. I think a lot of people like FMOD because the, the visual aspect is a little bit more familiar. Um, it, and it's quite good. It's got a nice... Uh, it doesn't really have any, like 90% you know, of, your, of your implementation is going to be, I want this event, I want this to play at this volume. And all, pretty much all of those solutions do that pretty well. Uh, but in-house in audio engines, about the only thing they've ever done better is profiling. And that's because, you know, it's made by the same devs that did the engine. That's, that's really the only benefit uh, to it. Cool. Um, and one more question on that idea of fatigue. Mm. Um, if fatigue is a potential issue, is there a solution from an audio design perspective as opposed to a compositional solution? Um, I mean, you're usually in charge of uh, the implementing. So, I mean, I usually make sure the composer has the final say because they usually have good opinions. I haven't really <laughs> had too many cases where I've disagreed with a composer. But you can just limit, I suppose, where certain things trigger. Like if it is a track you think will be uh, fatiguing, you find something else to put in there. Uh, or also, silence is also sometimes OK. You don't <laughs> have to have music through your game 100% of the time. In fact, sometimes a little bit of silence makes the music hit even nicer. Yeah. Great. Um, do we have time for one more? OK, perfect. Uh, let's have a look. Do you want a technical one or? Oh, I don't care. Yeah. Okay. What's most interesting? What's most upvoted? <laughs> OK, let's go with this one then. How yeah. do you feel about, the, about integration of sound design using music programming language, i.e. Pure Data or Max MSP? Uh, I think it sounds very, very cool, but I also think it's probably not super practical for 90% of games, um, probably 99% of games. You'd have to really, really have uh, a very specific want and need for it. Uh, a lot of this stuff's really cool, but most of us are working day jobs and there's budgets and a lot of people aren't willing to get super experimental. Uh, they're happy to experiment when they think it might save money, like with our lip sync solution, <laughs> but uh, not so much if you're just, you know, I think that's kind of a space for like the academic space to play in, not so much of the commercial space. Yeah. Interesting. Um, could you tell me a little bit about that 1% of projects that it might work for? Oh, I mean, just, uh, I guess if, I guess maybe indies that have very deep po pockets and big dreams. <laughs> um, Great. Yeah. Not well, many of lots them. of indies with big dreams. <laughs> We're halfway there. It's, it's a deep pockets <laughs> part. That's the hard part. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. We had better finish up there. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for your excellent talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming, and I'll see you on the main stage.